e-learn call. Um, we are, are we have a jam-packed session today. Um, my name is Judy Collins, and I am program coordinator um, at the AETC National Coordinating Resource Center. And I'll be facilitating the e-learn calls, uh, which is new for me. Many of you may know that this role was occupied by our former colleague and fearless Adobe Connect leader, Jenna Hardwell, um, who moved this summer, and we wish her well, and we miss her. But I will do my best to fill her very big shoes and look forward to working with you all on e-learn. Um, is there anyone who is on the call today who is new to e-learn? Okay. Well, we will talk more about um, the planning process for future calls um, at the end of this presentation, so stay tuned for that information. Um, just a few housekeeping notes. Please mute your computer speakers uh, to prevent an echo. Also, if you have to step away from the call, um, please do not place us on hold. It would be helpful if you could just hang up and call back um, in case your hold button is accompanied by music. Uh, feel free to post questions in our chat room, but there will be an opportunity to ask questions at the end of the presentation. So if you want to hold your questions until then, that is that is that is okay as well. Um, our topic today is caption this. It's an update on Section 508 compliance and captioning options. Um, our, our and our presenters are Mark Urban from the CDC and Donna Setzer from the Southeastern National TB Center. Um, our learning objectives for today will be to, uh, let's see, uh, upon completion of this training, participants will be able to explain that accessibility is a requirement, describe considerations for e-learn, and learn about some captioning options for your webinars and your training events. Just a little bit about our presenters today. Mark Urban uh, is Section 508 Coordinator and Compliance Officer for the CDC um, and also co-chair for, for the HHS uh, 508 program. Donna Setzer is Co-Executive Director and Director of E-Learning and Online Technology for the Southeastern National TV Center. She's been with them for eight years and has been involved with training technology long since. So um, we are lucky to have them both here today as they are experts in their field. Um, and, then, and also, it's very timely because this topic, uh, with new programs getting started and train activity, training activities and development, um, it, we need to be aware and abreast of all the accessibility and 508 compliance and captioning options available to us. So without further delay, I will turn it over to Mark Urban who will provide us with an overview of what we need to know for our federal programs. Thanks, Judy. Okay, uh, a couple of quick notes. Uh, I tend to speak fairly extemporaneously, so not everything I will say will be written on the slides. Uh, and also, if you hear me cough a little bit, it's because I had a pretty bad cold last week, and I'm still kind of fighting the occasional cough. So if I cough in your ear, my apologies ahead of time. Don't worry. Uh, I'm fully vaccinated. I work for the CDC, and I'm fully aware of infection control procedures. So um, let's talk a little bit about 508 in general. And a lot of people get kind of hung up on the term Section 508 compliance, and they think, well, you know, I'm going to look up Section 508 in the Federal Register, and I'm going to see that it relates to federal activities and what are federal activities? Am I a grantee? Am I a partner? How, whether I fall into this category or not? The answer is you don't care. Uh, Section 508 is one of a broad range of civil rights laws related to access to technology. You can quote various different laws. There's the Americans with Disabilities Act. There's Section 508. There's Section 504, which deals with grantees and recipients of federal funds. There's international conventions for some of your broader range activities. The short answer is if someone with a disability is having a challenge accessing your information, whether they work for you or whether they are a recipient of your e-learning, they are 
they have a standing to, to, to file a complaint with someone about it. Uh, so don't don't get too hung up on the legal legalese because if you follow the standards for e-learning and you make a good faith due diligence effort, people are going to respond to that. They're going to work with you to try and figure things out. But if you don't do anything, you're you're putting yourself at risk. You're putting your program at risk, and more importantly, you're putting your customers at risk. Your your program direction is to provide resources to a broad range of people, including a lot of providers. One of the things that a lot of people don't think about is that providers often have disabilities. And people say, well, how can you have a disability and be a provider? The answer is that a lot of times, if a provider develops a disability, and remember, a disability is the one minority group you can join at any time, uh, voluntarily or not, oftentimes people who are injured or who have a disability that expresses itself over time get moved into administrative training support roles rather than direct patient care. Uh, so we often get into a situation where the person who's going to be taking your training and then being the train the trainer or being the resource that's going to pass out your training may very well have a disability as well. A lot of people kind of skim over that or don't think through that, uh, that approach, but that's actually what we're finding in terms of our research into the healthcare workforce. So be be aware of that, be recognize that <laughs> access by persons with disabilities is in your mission requirements along with being a legal requirement. And again, if someone has questions about the legal part, we can save it to the end and I can I can talk law for hours and hours. Most people fall asleep when I'm talking anyway. If I start talking about law, but then we're going to re require a more significant um, means to get people awake, maybe some IV caffeine or something. There are standards. And the idea here is that the laws, all the laws, various laws say you must do accessibility. They talk about different standards. For e-learning, the standards I want you to focus on are the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines, WCAG 2.0. I've given you a link here, but they're technical standards. So the problem is, of course, is that they're technical. They're not necessarily something you as an e-learning coordinator or professional are going to want to get down into. It's something that your developer who's actually coding some e-learning for you might be interested in, in getting into. I'm going to talk about functionally what do you have to do, not <coughs> the very technical standard pieces that will that your developers want to have. But I did include it here so people have it as an option. The big issue that we have with e-learning, and in fact with any activity and related to accessibility, is uh, or disability accesses, people get confused between the concept of accessibility and accommodation. The legal terms of accommodation are what we think of when, when you talk to anyone who does e-learning or does any type of activity and they say, hey, if anybody with a disability has a problem, I will help them. I want to help people. I want to reach out. Uh, so if somebody with a disability shows up, I'll help them in any way they can. That's accommodation. It's an individual adjustment based on individual needs. And it is required by law. The challenge is, is oftentimes doing that, uh, that approach doesn't give you accessibility, meaning it doesn't give a standards-based design that people with disabilities can just use. And if they have a unique challenge, then they can get in touch with you. So a great example of this is accessibility is the ramp at the, at the entrance to a building. You know there's stairs. You know people who are not able to climb stairs are going to have challenges, whether they have a specific disability or not. You need to provide uh, options for people. And you might even have someone with a temporary disability. They broke their leg or they, you know, they're using crutches. Those, maybe they have a baby carriage. There are all different reasons why someone might need the ramp. You put the ramp in. You standard. You make it standards-based, and the vast majority of people can use that ramp without ever needing to talk to you about anything having to do with their disabilities. Once in a while, someone will come in with those big wheelchairs about the size of Montana or some Midwestern state. You know, it's got the test ball in the back and the whole bit, and um, you. <coughs> it's just not going to fit up the ramp. It's a standard ramp, but it's not going to fit up. Well, then you start doing you know, an individual adjustment based on individual needs. But I'll tell you now, if they come there and they see the ramp, uh, they're going to say, you made a good faith effort. It doesn't work for me, but you made a good faith effort. We'll talk about what we need to do. The same works in an electronic environment. If you make some basic elements that we're going to talk about, about making things accessible, if it doesn't work for somebody, generally they're going to respond to you to show that 
showed that you did due diligence, that you put a good faith effort in, and that you're trying to reach out uh, within this community. You'll, um, you need to do that accessibility. Besides being legally required, it puts you in a great situation from a risk mitigation standpoint, and it puts you in a wonderful situation in terms of outreach to a broad range of the population. Okay, so you got that, that it's required. So what is required? And I'm, this is my English language translations of very technical standards. So I want you to know that if you take this to a legal expert and say, well, this is what Mark Urban said, and this is all I had to do, uh, the answer is no. But this is a great, some great places to start. And this is uh, the kinds of things that you need to think about starting from, from square one. You don't need to do all of this um, immediately out the door, but you want to start it. And we're going to talk a little bit about how to start in, in a second when, when Donnie gets on. So first thing, provide alternatives for non-text content. That means if you've got a picture of something, if you've got a graphic of something, if you've got a, um, a table that's a picture of a table or some uh, neat tool that you've got that you're saying, hey, here's, you know, here's a graphic of why this is um, so important or, or how to, you've got a visualization of how to appropriately um, handle sterile needles, you would want to tag that. You would want to provide some textual content around it. It could be in the e-learning. It could be on the actual image. It's a special type of code. There are all different kinds of mechanisms to do that, but you need to do it. Anything that has that that's not actual text, including a picture of text, should have some something on it that says this is what this really is. Labeling forms and tables, that's a um, that's more of a developer kind of thing, but if you've got a form to fill out or if you've got information that people need to do to answer questions, there are ways to tag those and and describe those items that ensure that someone knows that they're now in, in the actual form and they can fill it out and navigate through it. Provide captions, descriptions, and other alternatives for multimedia. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to step away a little bit from uh, the, the general concept, because a lot of people use the word captions for anything having to do with multimedia and dealing with persons with disabilities. I kind of break it into three areas. One is CART, which is captioning at real time, dealing with a live presentation and how you address the captioning and providing support for people with, who have hearing or communications disorders right while you're doing it, like what we're doing right now in this presentation. There's a separate part, which includes captions for recorded multimedia. The CART has a lot of errors. I mean, if you've ever, uh, if you really want to see how bad captioning at real time is, even with the latest technologies, Go put on the Weather Channel and turn on the captions for a little bit and watch it. Um, you will be shocked at how significant the errors are. And some of the errors are uh, actually quite funny. Some of them could be interpreted as offensive. They're the best that, that people can do at the time because they're doing it on the fly as you're talking. Captions for recorded multimedia need to be exact. And uh, Donna's going to talk a little bit about the challenges that happen when you try to use strictly technology to solve this problem. Some of this requires a little bit of hands-on work, but it can be fairly easy to do, and, and she's going to talk about how to do it. Finally, it's something that you don't need any technology for. You just need to do a little thinking ahead of time, and that is describing visual-only elements. So I talked a little bit about, let's say you have a little movie of this is how you um, this is how you do handle universal precautions around a um, a patient who has HIV. Well, you're going to have a lot of visuals in there, too. Someone maybe donning, doffing uh, protective equipment, uh, hand washing techniques, things like that, uh, you know, sharps handling. If you can either describe what's happening on the screen at the time, or you can provide what's called an audio description track, which is a much more, OK, the person picks up the needle, takes the needle, um, puts it into the, the sharps box, turns, twists to the right, it uncaps the needle, they are then able to dispose of the syringe appropriately. However you want to uh, describe it, you can do it. I recommend that you simply articulate in an audio, in the audio stream, what you're doing. 
uh, because the, first of all, that helps in learning. Multimodality is by far the most effective means of reaching the broad range of learners with a broad range of requirements, whether or not they have a disability. Uh, so if you create a separate stream, then you're kind of approaching it from the separate but equal standpoint of creating a, an additional audio track that most people will never listen to and loses that, that kind of alternative learner value uh, and focuses simply on persons with disabilities. So I strongly recommend that you just describe things as you're doing them. If you have a chart, say, as this chart shows, trends in HIV throughout Africa are decreasing versus, as you can see, Africa's getting better. Same thing. I made enough information that a person with a disability knows what they're not seeing. I hope that's as clear as mud. OK, so let's keep on going. Other things you can do, uh, create content that's presented by assistive technologies without losing meaning. I know that sounds like a huge, massive uh, thing, but actually that's the simplified version of a very long technical standard. The English language translation of all this is avoid technologies that require lots of work to be made accessible. Um, a lot of flash e-learning and a lot of PDF documents are not accessible or have accessibility challenges that require uh, someone very knowledgeable to fix. That doesn't mean that you can't use flash. doesn't mean I'm telling people to, to use, not to use PDF or any other technology. Just recognize that you may be in a situation where you um, are using a technology that's going to require a lot of effort to meet. 508 requirements, and it's going to require you to bring bring in somebody who really knows how to do the hardcore coding back end. If you have such a person in hand, feel free. If you've got a PDF expert, they can make an accessible document. PDF can be made accessible. Flash can be made accessible. But you really want to think carefully about doing that. If you stick to standards like HTML5, you're going to, you're going to go be in a much better place in terms of ensuring accessibility, and it's much easier to find resources to fix it if you do have problems. Uh, make it easier for users to see and hear content. Things that, that will help you there are pre-send your materials. If you've got the materials in hand, go ahead and send them over the wall to participants so that they can see it and they can follow along using whatever assistive technology they want. Plus, they can, if they're a learner and they need to go back and say, wait, Mark said something about audio description back there. I, 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 I want to look at that again. They actually have a copy of the presentation that they can work with uh, to to try and, uh, and, and move through it. Sometimes you can't do that. Sometimes you can. Certainly, if you can, presenting materials adds a lot of value. Post-session transcripts. If you did get a transcript, if you do have captioning at real time, that gives, and uh, as long as you let everyone know it's error prone, it does give people an opportunity to go back and hear some of the things that were said if they missed something. Uh, if there was garbling on the phone or whatever. And it also provides a, an initial activity that can then be used as the basis for a more robust transcription and captioning activity that, that, that Donna's going to talk about a little bit. For your e-learning applications, for the e-learning environments that you work in, and for the trainings that you create, make all functionality available from a keyboard. This is the sine qua non of uh, e-learning tool accessibility. If you can't navigate through your training using just the keyboard. Uh, use the tab key for the most part, arrow keys, enter keys, that sort of thing. Uh, then, then you probably aren't accessible, and you are probably creating some risk for yourself uh, and, and missing out on, on some uh, opportunities there. OK. Other things. Don't make people ill with your trainings. So don't flash the screen. Uh, the technical standards say between 2 hertz, which is 2 times a second, and 50 hertz, which is 50 times a second. I just tell people don't flash the screen. Most people don't like the screen flashing. Most people don't. Uh, it very rarely adds value. And so you want to be very careful about that, because you can cause seizures. And we've had people get seizures from e-learning trainings that, that include screen flashing. Oftentimes, they create, uh, people use screen flashing when you create, uh, when you answer the wrong thing or you do the wrong activity. Be very careful of that. Be aware of that requirement. Um, like I say, if you want to talk about the technical standards, they're all in the technical link that I gave you um, in terms of the actual ranges of flashing that's appropriate. Have useful search table of contents and consistent buttons and menu options in your e-learning. 
that is just good practice in general, allow people to navigate through the content in the way they want to navigate through it, not in the here is your slide, this is the only slide you get to look at, here's your next slide, this is the only slide you get to look at kind of approach. It gives, it's a poor learning experience for people who are uh, iterative learners who need to hear the same information again, again, and again. It also provides opportunities for people with disabilities who need to be able to skip through some materials to get to the part that you're talking about on a consistent basis. So be consistent. Make sure things are um, searchable and you have a table of contents that allows people to navigate through the entire training. Avoid color alone. Now, I want to I want to point this out that for for those of you who aren't colorblind, this the word alone is in red. Note that it's also capitalized and underlined. There's nothing wrong with using color. Color can add a lot of value to visual learners. Just recognize that using just color will create challenges for people with disabilities. I know that it's often said that the number one disability among American men is listening, and I'm not going to argue that point, but uh, the statistics that we have at the CDC show that it's actually colorblindness, um, or what's often termed color wash, which is uh, that, that colors are paler and, and less discrepancy than, than people normally see. So recognize that you can use color as a tool for uh, drawing attention to information. Just don't use color alone. If someone presents a wrong answer, don't just turn it red. Put an asterisk next to it saying, you know, items marked with an asterisk are incorrect. Uh, use, a, uh, use a capital letters. Use a font change. Underline things. There are a number of options you can use. I'm not telling you what you can't do. I'm telling you the things to avoid, and that's avoid using color alone as a resource. Allow people to email and chat your questions. Um, if a person has a communication disorder and can't speak well, um, or if they're, you know, if they if they're like me and you know they come from different parts of the country, they're going to have a slightly different accent. It's always better to give people an option that allows uh, for effective communication and to capture that information. And finally, when you put out your announcement for your e-learning, when you start reaching out to various organizations to participate in your e-learning, ask people ahead of time if they need accommodation for a disability. And that way you can get that special environment fixed. Some people ask for Braille. Some people ask for large print. Some people say, I need a sign language interpreter. All of those are specialized, unique activities that, that are relevant to individual populations of persons with disabilities. And so you need to know ahead of time. So ask them to tell you and ask them to tell, ask them ahead of time and then tell them to tell you ahead of time so you have time to put that in place. OK. So I'm going to summarize here. I want to give people plenty of time for questions. And I want to give Donna the opportunity to show you how easy this really is to do in practice. Uh, in terms of, of doing captioning. So from my perspective and from your perspective in terms of whether you're a grantee, you're a partner, you're a provider, uh, if, if I'm someone who has a disability and can't get access to your information, I can find a reason or a legal requirement for you. The fact is you have to do it. Accessibility and accommodation are both required by law. They're required by your learning requirements to ensure that people understand the information in a format they can understand. And finally, they, they fit right into your mission of, of providing as broad a resource as possible to as many providers and as many uh, partners as possible. E-learning developers, you, you really have to consider that not everyone can see, hear, speak, or use a mouse. Um, that doesn't mean that you can't have things that add value to each of those areas. Just recognize that the base that you're providing should allow for the fact that one of those things will not, uh, might not be happening at the user level. OK, well, I'm sure this generated lots of questions. But before we get into the questions about the law and requirements, if you want to go ahead and write some in the chat, that's fine. Uh, but I'm going to turn it over to my colleague, Donna, who's going to get into some of the details about how to do this and how to do this right. Donna? Thank you. Thanks, Mark. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Dawn, and I'm going to talk to you a bit today about um, how SMTC is handling captioning. So we run probably between 10 and 15 webinars a year, 
And each of those we post on our website afterwards. We record them and post them on our website. Now, um, when we do that, we include handouts and we include a transcription. Um, we've been doing that for a number of years. We uh, have chosen to use a transcript service. We provide them with an MP4 file, MP4 file of the audio after the presentation, and we send them our presentation slide. Sorry. Um, we used to just give them the words. They used to ask for just like whatever you know uncommon words that uh, we thought that they could use. We found that just sending them the presentation slides it makes a huge difference because then they can see right in the context of what you were talking about what those unfamiliar words are, and it has cut down tremendously on the amount of errors that we have in our transcript. So we send those trans we send the file and the um, slides off to the transcript service. We use Caption Colorado. Um, we're currently paying $150 in audio hours. So we have a two-hour webinar. It's $300. Um, this has been um, a great value to us. You might go, oh my gosh, $300, that's a lot of money for every webinar. But it would take anyone in our office much longer to do this than, um, than $300. So we get it back within 24 hours, and it's clean. We've had maybe one or two instances where we got through the first three paragraphs, and we were like, this is a mess. We're not sure who transcribed this. We send it back. And within 24 hours, we have a perfectly clean one, and we have not paid anything more for it. So they stand behind their product. I'm not promoting Caption Colorado. There's plenty of those captioning services out there. Um, this one has worked for us. Um, like I said, we have it back within about 24 hours, and it looks like this. It's a, a Word document or a text file that is all, every, all, everything that was said. And we have asked for things such as the ums and the ahs not to be included, but if that's important to you, they can include all of that. So we review it and edit it. Like I said, we find very, very minimal. Uh, maybe they misspelled someone's name and it's someone we know, so we go ahead and you know fix that name. Um, we then post the transcript and the handout to our site. And at the, that's where we stopped until about a month ago when I got a call from some people at AETC about talking about this, and I thought, you know, this is what we're doing today, and it works. But I think these days, with some of the technology out there, we can actually do more. And so, um, so we're starting to do more, and I want to share that with you. YouTube um, is a wonderful service out there, as many of you are familiar with. We post all of our webinars on YouTube. So they're on, you can access them from our website, but they're actually posted on YouTube. Um, one, we get far more hits from YouTube, and we've, we've grown our audience by having our files out on YouTube. And two, uh, there's, on the back end, there's so many more um, analytics that you can get off of YouTube than we could ever have on our own website. So that's what we do. You have options to do your closed captioning. You can either type that text directly into YouTube, so you could have someone who listens to your um, to your uh, presentation and transcribes directly into YouTube. As you can imagine, that would take hours. But they do have codes where you can stop the video and back it up and forward it to listen to word by word if you wanted to do that. Um, or you can create that transcript file, which we've already done, and load that into YouTube, and it will automatically sync up the words to the, um, to the video. So there's only a few very minor things that they recommend that you do. Um, you put a blank line in between each of the um, kind of the new a start of each slide, um, and our transcription service has already done that, so that's a done for us. Um, the second thing is if there's music or laughter or any other kind of background noise that you want to capture, um, you put that in brackets. Again, our transcription service has already done that for us. So the third and only thing that we have to do is go in and note where th there's a change in speaker. Uh, that took me about five minutes to do on this sample that I'm, which it was an hour-long webinar. It took me about five minutes to do that because most of your speaking is going to be one person. 
not until you get to the Q&A at the end where you might have some back and forth going on. Um, and again, I believe we could ask our transcript service to, to do that for us if we provided them with the names. Um, so I've given you the link down at the bottom of how of the YouTube details if you um, want to get that when you uh, get these slides. But, um, so here's just an example of how that looks once I did it. So you'll see this was Karen who gave the welcome, and then Dr. Alvarez starts talking, and then Dr. Alvarez goes on for about 40 minutes, and it's not until I got to the very end that I had to add in a few more names. So it's very, um, very quick and easy. And then um, once you have that done, then you just go into your YouTube channel. Uh, I am not going to get in today as to how to set up a YouTube channel or any of that. If you have questions and need support, um, you probably have someone in your office who knows, but I'm happy to help you too if you need help. Um, so you post that to your, you post your video to the YouTube channel, and then you need to go into the video manager, which is up at that top left corner, and find your video. And then you want to select the arrow that's beside edit right here, and then the drop down, which has subtitles and CC. I found that a little hard to find, and that's the only reason why I stepped you through this, so you can have those steps. Um, and once you're there, you click that Add New Subtitles or CC. You're going to say you want English, unless you want some other language. And you select to upload the file. And then it's literally that easy. YouTube does the rest of it. And I, I, wanted, to, I wanted to show a video example, but it was going to be too challenging to do that here today. But literally, as Karen is saying, welcome to the first of eight sessions on advanced concepts in pediatric TV, YouTube has synced that up for us. I didn't have to do anything with the timing. All I had to do was load that file. So um, again, it took us, it cost for a two-hour video, it cost $300 that we were already spending. And then maybe another half hour of my time to get this loaded for them now to have anybody who wants can just click the CC on the bottom right corner of their screen and get the closed captions. So um, that's all I have. And if there's any questions, I think Mark and I are both open to answering them. Thank you, Mark. And thank you, Donna. Are there any burning questions from the group right now? I see Edgar is typing in something. I actually have a question. Um, Mark, this is for you. We talked about this a little bit yesterday. Um, can you tell us a little bit about the difference between um, the federal standards, well, the standards, rather, for, uh, for grant-funded versus cooperative, cooperative agreement um, programs? Sure. Um, and the, the important thing to remember between the two of them is that if you're receiving a grant, you have a general requirement to make things accessible. So the list of, of things that need to get done uh, that I gave you in this presentation gives you a good baseline uh, to, to meet that requirement. Um, so when you hear, uh, you'll often hear things about 508 compliance and, and testing. Uh, a lot of those don't apply directly to grant activity. Instead, if you, you need to have done due diligence to show if there is a concern or complaint, either internally or for internal or external activities, you can say, yeah, we're doing accessibility. Here's what we're doing. This is how we're doing it. And this is what we're meeting. You may have local laws and standards that are specific. And your local laws or standards take precedence if there's a question about whether you're going to follow the federal standards or you're going to follow the local standards. Follow the standards that apply to your organization. But you have to do accessibility. That, that general requirement, what we call program accessibility in terms of federal funds, is a requirement. It's listed in your grant uh, requirements as Section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act. It doesn't matter. It still has to get done. It still has to be done for e-learning. If you're doing, if you're a partner with CDC or any of the uh, the Department of Health and Human Services activities, NIH or whatever, you're going to find that there's a very specific process because we're going to use what you're creating as something that we give out as a resource, which means we need to, it needs to meet 
federal standards for accessibility, which means it needs to actually meet Section 508. So that technical standard link that I gave you, that's where those technical standards are. If you go, and when we get to uh, the last slide, there's a slide that will give you the link to the HHS 508 page that has actual acceptance criteria for all the various uh, standards. Uh, there it is, 508.hhs.gov. So if you're do it, creating a PDF document or a Word document or you're creating an HTML site or you're creating a, a, a training, the specific acceptance criteria for HHS will be listed there. And if you aren't sure, there's a list of contacts that you can reach out to. I'm the one for CDC uh, that uh, can give you additional information about exactly what's required. Um, so, uh, so the short answer is, if you're if you're grantee, use the tools and discussions that we've we've provided here. If you are a um, a partner, then we're going to need to meet 508 standards for the department, and you want to reach out to your program officer exactly what those standards are and, and what exactly needs to happen because they will get checked okay. uh, and evaluated. Okay, um, I see there is a question here from Edgar. Salinas, um, he says, uh, great information and thank you for taking the time for the session. Do you know of any tools that can be used to verify the techniques um, you're using and, or for example, screen readers? Okay, uh, and the answer is uh, I do have some suggestions, but again, they're suggestions. Legally, the requirement is that um, you meet the technical standards. So those, a lot of those things that I told you needed to happen are assistive technology agnostic, uh, which means it doesn't matter which assistive technology you're using. Any of them will need those pieces to be in place in order for things to work. That keyboard navigability doesn't matter which assistive technology someone's using. Uh, I tell people not to get too hung up on it, but you will. You may need to fire up some assistive technology to to work on things. Now there are two tools that I would point people to right off the bat. If you're looking to try and evaluate your web-based um, resource, you can go to webaim.org and there is a tool called WAVE. Uh, that is a free checker that will provide a very accurate depiction of what your training or your HTML resource looks like to assistive technology. Um, don't hesitate to use that tool. It's, it's on the first link that's that's, uh, that's in this list of links. Uh, recognize also that there are other tools that you can get. You can get a free version of a screen reader called JAWS, uh, and you can uh, just do a search for JAWS screen reader, and you'll find it. Um, the the JAWS screen reader is uh, is downloadable and usable for 40 minutes at a time without uh, a license. Uh, you should not be using it for continuous testing by a license if you're going to use it all the time. But if you have something that you only need to do a once over on, uh, it's a great tool that, that uh, can help you uh, do an evaluation. The problem I have with, with using a screen reader is unless you're blind, you're going to find using a screen reader doesn't add a lot of value for you. Um, I recommend uh, a tool if you're going to spend some money and you're it, trying to do an evaluation of an actual online resource. One of the better tools I use is Zoom Text Reader, which is a screen magnifier and screen reader. And the screen magnifier moves the focus uh, of the screen around, but you can actually see what's being displayed to a uh, an individual with a disability, whereas JAWS is just going to read it to you. People who use JAWS use it at such a high speed. When I do testing for JAWS, people just sit next to me and they're like, how can you follow this? You can follow it because you're, you're used to it. I strongly recommend people not use straight screen readers as testing tools because it just requires the level of knowledge and expertise to use it as an effective testing tool is oftentimes more than the value you're going to get out of it. Make sure you meet those standards that I've described. And if it doesn't work with assistive technology, it's going to be a very simple fix rather than a, a detailed re-engineering. I, I hope that was as clear as mud. That was comprehensive, yeah. <laughs> um, are there any other questions? I do have one other question. Um, and again, this is for you, Mark and Donna. You can answer as well. Um, what do you think is an ex 
what is the acceptable length of time to get our, our transcribed information posted to our websites um, after a training? Um, I, I know, Donna, you said that, that Caption Colorado is very quick, um, but sometimes um, it may take a little longer for the program um, coordinators, et cetera, to, to, to get the information all mapped out and, and posted. So what is a good length of time that we should be considering for our, our, our viewers and our audience? So for us, we, um, we get our information out there as soon as we can. So um, our video itself can be turned around usually within 24 hours. So when we have the video ready, we post it. That way, you know, 99 plus percent of our audience can start seeing it. The same is true of our handouts. Those are ready. Um, so maybe another 24 to 48 hours later, our transcript is ready. Since we, after we get it back, we need to review it also. So within a week, we have our video, our handout, and our transcript ready. And then um, as we have time in our schedule, which again is usually within just a few days, then we can have the closed captioning ready on YouTube. So you know, beginning to end, we're probably at about two weeks. We're making an effort, but we don't hold right. anything in order for us to have everything complete. Right, right. Yeah, and I and I just add to that. Um, there's one of the things you can do is in the description when you post it, especially if you post it on YouTube or, or wherever you post that information and have that resource available. Uh, go ahead and, and say that a captioned version is coming and when it's, you plan for it to be up. Uh, there's two reasons for that. One, it, it allows persons with disabilities to be able to look at that right away and say, okay, well, I know there's a captioned version up. It's going to be up in a week and a half, and I'll go check in a week and a half and get it. Uh, it also allows someone to say, okay, I know that you're putting good faith effort into addressing this, um, and you'll, you know, that resource will be available shortly. Uh, so it forestalls many people when they're uh, concerned that they can't get information. It also provides very clear uh, direction in terms of what you're doing to, to, to provide support for accessibility without denying the resource to people um, just because of accessibility. I, I tell people all the time, do your stuff accessibly. Don't not do stuff because of accessibility. Um, right. the, the purpose is not to prevent people from having access to it. It's for it's for ensuring that everyone has access to it as quickly as you can reasonably do it. We all have to make program activity decisions. Uh, if you're doing something for, like I said, if you're doing something for HHS as a partner, they're going to want you to, to to give it to them. Uh, they're not even going to consider it complete until the captioning file is is set and ready to go with it. Um, that's that's part that should be part of your planning activities around it. Uh, the other side of that coin, and I don't, this probably goes without saying, don't say you're going to do something and provide something unless you're actually going to do it. Um, the the worst thing you can do is say, yeah, we're going to have that caption. Uh, resource up in two weeks, and then six months later, it still says you're going to have the caption support up two weeks. Um, one thing I forgot to mention earlier that I think um, when you are captioning, um, YouTube has been a great tool. Um, they also have auto-generated captioning, and you could say, oh, why not just turn that auto-generated captioning on and we're done. Um, it's probably just as bad as CART or maybe worse. Um, especially when it comes to medical terminology. So be very um, leery of doing that. If you think that's what you want to do, make sure you watch it and read it um, to make sure um, I, not only is it misinformation that you might be sending out from a medical standpoint, but um, some may even find what they see offensive. So just be, um, just be aware of that. Yeah, in fact, I would have to say that HHS as an organization in our, in terms of how we approach grant, uh, even, even grant level support, we don't consider those auto captions as meeting the requirements for accessibility, program accessibility. Uh, so generally speaking, you, you, generally speaking, you can't, if you want to turn those on that is, or have that as an option, that's fine. Uh, don't consider that you've met accessibility in any way, shape, or form, or that would that would be considered due diligence in trying to meet this need. So, are there any? Are there any for us? 
Yeah, for us, it just it has not been as expensive or as time consuming as uh, we envisioned when we were first told that this was going to be necessary. That's good to know because I think this it seems like a daunting task. Um, I think a lot maybe some of our, our our audience you know they may have more questions as they begin as their their training programs get underway and they start to think about it more. Um, I know that I will have more questions and I hope that it would be okay to reach out to either one of you. Um, sure. Um, as we begin our training. Um, Certainly, um, we have a we have a help desk uh, at CDC. Uh, so if you have a question about 508 in general, feel free, or accessibility in general, you can feel free to reach out to the 508 Help Desk here at CDC. If, um, if you send something to me, I'll probably forward it to the Help Desk to answer a technical question. Uh, just as a final note, I wanted to say focus on, uh, in this case, you know, it's kind of like, probably it's kind of like golf. You can become an expert in accessibility and, and play at the professional league. You don't need to play at the professional league to provide some basic support to persons with disabilities and to meet this need. Um, start as as Donna has by just just you know putting the ball down and hitting it, and you'll be surprised how far you can hit it. Uh, yes, Gracie slides will be available, um, and the audio will be posted to our website as well. Um, at the conclusion of this call. Uh, so yes, you will be available to access it there as well. I have, um, there's a slide now showing Mark and Donna's email address. So if you do have further questions about the presentation, feel free to reach out to them. Um, Mark and Donna, thank you so much. Uh, if there are no other questions, uh, I guess we could just conclude and move forward. Um, there, the next call has not been determined as of yet. Um, we have not um, begun our planning um, phase of the eLearn. If anyone is interested in participating in the planning of future eLearn calls, my email address is there on the screen, and I will type it in the chat box so that we could, um, column J3, um, plan future calls. Um, I will send an email or a planning meeting um, notice around after this in the next week so we can get started on that going forward for the grant year. Um, once again, thank you, uh, Mark, and thank you, Donna. Um, sorry. <laughs> um, for, for participating on our call today. We, I'm sure you will have more questions. I will have more questions. Feel free all to reach out to them. And we look forward to moving forward with eLearn. Um, I guess we can conclude the call if there are no other questions. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thanks for the invitation. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks,